the system requires us to track where ideas come from and how well they stand up to test. Now, when I say it's mine, what I mean is I didn't get it from anybody else. Okay, I put this together based on what I understood. That means if it turns out to be borne out by empirical tests, as it now has, that that tells you something about how good my model is. Not perfect. Maybe I could have been more precise. I certainly could have been earlier and I wish I had. But nonetheless, the point is, one, if the system is supposed to work, people who have predictive power have to have their credibility elevated. Now, you and I, so if the system does this badly, if you elevate thieves, for example, then you get the inverse effect where people who aren't responsible for a particular thing get credit and they have their uh, credibility elevated. For the system to evolve in the right direction, you have to be able to track who is capable of seeing something coming, making a valid prediction, and then having that prediction borne out. But the other thing is you and I have endured um, shocking indictments of our credibility and effectively attacks on whether or not we belonged in a conversation about COVID and its treatment. And this has gone on for a very long time, and it's been in some very close quarters. We have been ruthlessly attacked by Sam Harris, of course, who has indicted our credibility. And he said, he's not the guy to do any of this analysis because he doesn't know what's going on, but clearly we don't either. Now, my point would be, this doesn't have to be my hypothesis alone, but if you can see that I'm capable of taking the facts of this and somehow being way ahead of the folks at Pfizer who apparently still can't explain why myocarditis has anything to do with their damn shot, right? And ahead of Paul Offit, who is blaming uh, molecular mimicry of uh, heart proteins and all of that, if you can see that, then you know that somehow this is legitimate analysis that is leading you to see things well ahead. Even the authors of this paper call their observations new. They say this suggests a new pathology. Well, it's not. It was predicted by uh, by hypothesis outside of any laboratory setting. And that is an important, that is an important consideration. A, a model that is capable of predicting results in the lab is a powerful model. And so all I'm saying is somewhere we have to have the tables turned on all of the attacks that were made on our credibility, because the fact is we have been right. We didn't guess where we were wrong, we corrected it. And that is what you want in, in people who are analyzing situations on which our health depends. That's right. Um, you know, we've, we've spent, we've dipped in and out of sort of philosophy of science and epistemology. That is how it is that we make claims of truth. On what basis do we make claims of truth? Uh, many times on Dark Horse and, and elsewhere. Um, but it warrants um, a revisit here. Because it's, part, it's part of what you're doing. It's part of what is implied by what you're talking about here. And uh, part of you know, one way, one of many ways to categorize science, um, types of science, ways of doing science, um, <clears throat> you know, the kinds of things that scientists engage in <clears throat> is empirical versus theoretical work. Right? <clears throat> and uh, empirical work is that which uh, takes a hypothesis and usually Hopefully, uh, it is the researcher uh, who is doing the empirical work, who is himself or herself generated the hypothesis or hypotheses that they are testing, um, and uh, describes and uh, executes an experimental test or an observational test uh, of said hypothesis and generates data, actual numbers, actual measurements, and then does the analysis on those data. Uh, and um, depending on the type of work, a statistical analysis, uh, perhaps, um, or some other analysis, and generates a result. That is empirical work in which there is something that has actually been measured. The generation of hypothesis, uh, or <clears throat> the uh, in, in including the generation of hypothesis uh, where you do not have any intention of, nor do you have the background to, because you do not have the familiarity with the equipment, <clears throat> with the various molecules you might be measuring um, <clears throat> in a field um, where you can look at what is out there and say, I think it's this. This is, this is the prediction that I make given what we can see right now. And here's what would have to be true if so. That is theoretical work. 
because it does not include any measurement. You do not, <clears throat> you, you do not have to be out there measuring and analyzing data in order to be doing theoretical work. Both are necessary. Both theoretical work and empirical work are necessary to do science for a variety of reasons. From something like the mid-20th century on, and you know, maybe to some degree from time immemorial, but empirical work has been privileged, has in 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 big science, in academic science. This is in part because it leaves a clear trace and in part because it is expensive to do. And expensive is a good thing uh, for the purposes of academic science, because expensive science means big grants, means lots of overhead to the universities. It's a favored thing. It is, it, is a, it, it is the thing that the administrations of universities who house scientists want. They want scientists to do expensive science, not inexpensive science, because expensive science forces the scientists to spend more of their time being grants getters and grant administrators as opposed to actually doing science. Whereas theory, and you know, the term theoretician is confusing with regard to you know, our contention that you know, it's not a theory until it's passed you know, many, many, many um, <clears throat> uh, basically tests, right? It's a hypothesis to start. Um, but, we, but we call these theoreticians versus uh, empiricists. Theoreticians largely don't need big grants to do their work. And so this is one of several reasons um, that theoretical work has been pushed to the wayside uh, in modern scientific circles. And as a result, you have a number of people who um, have degrees in science, who have the accoutrements of science, who appear to be doing science, who are who the media go to when they need something sciencey to be said to them, who might not recognize a hypothesis with a testable prediction if it hit them in the head. And that means that what they're doing may be absolutely necessary, but it's a piece of science and it's not all of science. And frankly, it's not the hard part of science. It's not the rigorous part of science. Using equipment that other people have generated with molecules uh, that are signifiers, that are proxies for things that other people have generated is not actually that hard. It's a little bit like following a recipe. And you have to be good at following a recipe, but you don't have to actually be able to see the big picture, whereas theoreticians generally do. So one, it's worse than that for theory. And the reason that it's worse than that is that not only is theory cheap to do, but theory eliminates a large fraction of the experimental work that gets done by giving you a map of where to look. So say that more. So what, what you what you mean there is, um, if you don't have an idea about what you're doing, if you don't have a map, if you don't have a theoretical understanding of the situation, you could throw the dice and do any number of uh, almost infinite number of experiments, and most of them will be irrelevant because all it would have taken was um, having a theoretical approach to begin with to narrow uh, the narrow the subset of experiments uh, or tests of hypothesis that you might have done in the first place. Yeah, that are worth doing. Right. And in fact, you can see that right here because right. let's say we take um, Paul Offit's feeble understanding of the danger of these things, mm -hmm. okay? It's based on the antigen that the mRNA uh, transcript produces. Well, let's suppose you wanted to make some other so-called vaccines on the same platform. You gotta run a test for every single one of them in order to figure out whether they are good or bad antigens. Yep. On the other hand, if the theoretical viewpoint says, actually, no, the platform is fundamentally flawed and it's not, you know, spike protein's bad, but it's not just the spike protein. The lipid nanoparticles are bad, but it's not just the lipid nanoparticles. It's actually the most fundamental element here, the one you can't swap out, which so is- So is bad. Yeah, well, it's <laughs> the mRNA transcripts that produce a foreign protein in your cells, which is gonna get your cells targeted. And then the pseudouridine stabilization of the mRNAs that make this process a long-term process rather than a short-term process. If your theoretical understanding leads you to that, the point is you don't need to go test every antigen. That's right. It's already, it, it, it's not going to be productive. As soon as you've got a foreign antigen, you know that you're stepping into the same mechanism. Now you might wanna run a few tests because it would tell you something. If, hey, it doesn't matter what antigen we swap in, as long as it's foreign, we see the same thing. That would tell you, oh yeah, this model was correct. But knowing that this Test model- Test from is, widely disparate antigens. Right. Yeah. So the point is the part of the academic system that has uh, gone full bore on the idea that the data is king, that uh, 
science is high, is uh, data is driven, data -driven yeah. right? This is a coup, and it is staged against theory. Now you can't doing theory alone isn't any good. You have to do the empirical tests, but someone does. Someone does, and that's the, the other thing. The empirical tests have to be done. The empirical tests have to be done, and I was going to argue. But the you empirical said, tests also can't exist absent the theoretical work in the in the first place, and those can be done by the same people. They can be. Now, there's a risk when they are done by the same people. And the risk is that the perverse incentives cause us to see a false scientific picture because people who have a dog in the fight may run a test that they may throw away the tests that falsify and they may publish the tests that validate. Yeah, well, but, but I mean, just you know, from, from our particular experience, you didn't do that much empirical work. Right. Um, I, I did, uh, and it was not in this scope at all. Uh, and both of us 100% generated our own hypotheses. Yep. We, were, we were acting as both um, you know, theoretical theoreticians and empiricists um, for the, the field work that we did. Uh, and what we haven't spelled out here explicitly is when it is you who are going to then be doing the empirical work, it is even more necessary than um, under other circumstances that you look in advance to try to find the complete solution set of possible hypotheses. Um, such and, you know, will you still have one that you favor? Perhaps. Perhaps. And that is what the scientific process is supposed to help eradicate. You're, you know, the, the individuals who are doing the science will have bias. And you cannot get rid of human bias. Um, but the scientific method is one road uh, to minimizing it. Um, you may still have favorite hypotheses. But if you have many, all of which might explain a pattern that you have observed, then you are less likely to say, ah, um, you know, as, as you falsify one after another of your you know, treasured hypotheses, well, that's just the way it goes. I'm out here to try to figure out what is true, as opposed to uh, validate what I think is true, even as I continue to see evidence that I was wrong. That's all well and good in places where you don't have huge financial incentives. Um, you know, if you're studying frogs or bats or whatever, yep. you can teach people that they have to have scientific integrity and it might work. It doesn't work when you come close to the money. That was that is what I learned from the the T. Lemire debacle. Yep. Was the closer you get to the money, the more ruthless people become, the more eager they are to steal, the more um, clever they are at lying to themselves. Mm -hmm.